Okay, welcome back to BC213. Uh, this is our second lecture today on the end times. And we're going to continue from where we paused before the break. So I'm going to go back to our lecture notes. So what we did was an, an overview of <clears throat> what do you call that, just an outline of the sequence of some of the main events going from where we are today in the church age all the way to the new heavens and the new earth. Now we're going to get into the details, right? So each piece, step by step, we go in, we'll, we'll, we'll journey through the book of Revelation that will take us all the way through uh, into the new heavens and the new earth. So, uh, uh, we'll, you know, we'll turn through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, just give you an overview of it. We're not going to read every verse, but I'll just give you a summary, an overview of uh, each chapter that will kind of lead us through here. So, we begin first of all with the rapture of the church. So, Christ's return, the coming of Jesus, um, we say uh, is in two stages. One is he's coming for the first, he's coming for the church, which we call the rapture of the church. And then, which is generally referred to as the second coming of Christ, is when he's going to come at the end of the seven years of tribulation and we come with him. Right? So, what are the scriptures we can look at? Let's turn in our Bibles, please, to First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we will read from verses. 13 to 18. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Somebody could read that for us, please. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Mm -hmm. uh, go on to verse 18. Okay. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we all will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words mm -hmm. thank you so let's look at these in detail right it says here um verse 13 says i don't want you to be ignorant in other words i want us i want us paul is saying i want us to know i have this understanding about what happens when people die and what is going to happen in the time to come. So it says, don't be ignorant. Those who fall asleep, that means they die. Now, we should not get confused, but, <clears throat> but the language that he's using here, those who, verse 13, those who have fallen asleep, right? The, it doesn't mean um, that, you know, they're just sleeping on the ground, that their spirit and soul is there, sleeping no it's just a way of saying these people have died they are dead so when they are dead what happens there they are with the lord right so how do we know they are with the lord because he says in verse 14 god will bring with him those who sleep in jesus that means these people have died in christ but where are they? They are with the Lord. He says, God will bring with him. That means these people who have died in Christ, that means they are believers. Believers have died. Where are they? They're not sleeping in the ground somewhere. They're not floating around the earth somewhere. No. When a believer dies, he goes to be with the Lord. 
right? And so Paul is telling us here, you know, we don't have to sorrow as those who have no hope, but we know that they are with the Lord and we also know that Jesus died and rose again, and that's enough for us. If Christ died and rose again, then obviously we also will live. We also will be raised. The same Christ who raised was raised from the dead. God who raised Christ from the dead will also raise us up from the dead. So he says in verse 14, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Right? And how is this going to happen? Verse 15, he says, and he says, you know, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you what God has revealed to me and giving you the word of the Lord that uh, the coming of the Lord, when that happens, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So there's going to be this great announcement in heaven. There's going to be this archangel who's uh, announcing Christ is coming and, uh, uh, and, and, and the trumpet of God will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. I mean, and we who are alive, that means we are alive, we are on the earth, the believers who are on the earth, will be caught up together and we will meet the Lord in the air. So this coming is different from the Revelation 19 coming where he comes in a very militant way. He comes with the armies of heaven. He comes to destroy the Antichrist and the false prophet. So that coming is very different. This coming is, he's coming for those who have, who belong to him. Right? So it's very, you know, the, 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 the details of these two uh, events are very, very different. Very different. So he comes and he and 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 then he says, you know, verse seventeen: "We who are alive and remain shall be caught up together." Now, it's very interesting that the you know the word rapture doesn't appear in the English Bible, um, and it's not in the Greek text, but in the Latin, that word "caught up" in verse seventeen, which we just read, is. Um, is the word rap simu, simul, and of course I can't speak Latin, but simul rapimor. So simul rapimor. So that means simultaneously together, right? So that's where we get the English word rapture from the Latin Bible, right? So some sometimes people will say. Hey, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Uh, yes, it's not in the Greek text, but they didn't have something like that in the Greek text. But that word, English word rapture, is derived or is based on the Latin rapimor, which simply means to be simultaneously together. Right? Simultaneously, we are caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. So that's where we get the word rapture. So in one sense, yeah, it is in the Bible, but it's in the Latin version from which we get the English word rapture. Okay. And then he says, verse 17, thus we shall always be with the Lord. Okay. So it's described for us that this whole event of the rapture is described for us here in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Now, we also want to look at 1 Corinthians 15 because Paul tells us what happens uh, at that moment. So you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to read verses 51 to 58, please. Can somebody read that? Or we can, yeah, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 58. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
and this mortal must put on immortality so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal mortal has put on immortality then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written death is swallowed up in victory o death where is your sting o hades where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ therefore my beloved brethren be steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the lord mm. thank you so this is a parallel text paul is saying look with this verse 51 he's saying look i want to tell you a mystery or meaning something that has been hidden but it's revealed to us now i want i want to share something that god has revealed to us what does god reveal he says look we're not all going to die that means some some believers will be alive some believers of course will die but there will be both these groups of people believers and then in a moment in a twinkling of an eye it's going to happen instantaneously right so he, the and he again he talks about the last trumpet the trumpet will sound so that means there is the sounding of a trumpet and meaning this is the final trumpet okay now we should and I will explain this a little later on, okay? Uh, I, but I'm just mentioning it here, highlighting it here. We do not confuse the sounding of the trumpet that is mentioned in First Thessalonians chapter four, and also in First Corinthians fifteen. We don't confuse that with the trumpets that are sounding. Uh, with the seven seals, seven bowls, and the seven trumpets, which are announcing judgments during the tribulation. Okay, don't confuse the two. Right? Trumpets are used in many places in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And, and we will explain this a little later. I'm just mentioning it here because you know, we, we read it. In the Old Testament, trumpets were, were used to, uh, you know, gather people together so when they wanted to mobilize people say hey come together you know we need to get into action maybe we need to resume our journey maybe we need to go into battle something whatever to call people together trumpet was used okay with the people of god but in revelation seven trumpets are used to announce these judgments that are being poured out okay so we don't confuse the two right in both First Thessalonians chapter four and in First Corinthians fifteen, there is the sounding of a trumpet. Okay, and uh, we will explain it a little later. There is a sounding of the trumpet when 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 Christ, you know, comes out of heaven, and there is one more trumpet sounding when these people or when people are being raised from the dead. Now remember. Old Testament trumpet was used to call people together, and this is this this rapture is really a calling people together. Who those who are in Christ? Some are dead, some are alive, but we are all being called together, summoned together, where to meet the Lord in the air. Okay, so that's the purpose of the sounding of the trumpet in connection with First Thessalonians four. And first Corinthians 15. It's a sounding of a trumpet, and now first trumpet announcing Christ is coming out of heaven. Second trumpet summoning people together, believers, those who died, those who are alive, summoning them to meet the Lord in the air. That's the those are the trumpet sounds. Okay. So there's first trumpet, Christ coming out of heaven, which we read in First Thessalonians 4. Second trumpet or the last trumpet is Hey, people, wake up, come together. Who? Believers coming together. Okay. So this is what's used here uh, in, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Corinthians 15. So verse 52, the trumpet will sound. 
And what happens? The dead will be raised. Now Paul is telling us something more here, 1 Corinthians 15, which he hasn't shared with us uh, in, in 1 Thessalonians 4. What he's saying is that when we are raised, we are going to receive a different kind of a body. He says, we will be raised with incorruptible, immortal bodies. We are, it, over which death has no more effect. Uh, and so we just use the term glorified bodies or resurrected bodies, right? To talk about the body that we will receive of when we are raised from the dead. Right? And we're going to read a few more scriptures which will show us that the body we receive, the glorified body or the resurrected body, is the same as the body that Jesus had after his resurrection. Meaning, this is a body that is of a different kind of material, it, over which death has no effect. Right? So we receive glorified bodies and uh, death has been conquered. Okay, let's read some of scriptures in John 14. Now, I just want us to read these. Maybe we may have read them before, uh, but uh, it's good to read it in context of what we are studying. So let's go to John 14, and we will read verses 1, 2, and 3, please. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that there I am, there you may be also. Mm -hmm. Now, thank you. So Jesus told his disciples, look, I'm going to my Father's house. Of course, it's heaven. So I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to build a mansion for you, meaning something very big, grand, I'm going to build a mansion for you. I'm going to build mansions for you. Right? And then he said, if I'm going there and preparing a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am. What is that where I am? The mansion in heaven, my father's house. You will be there. So what can we highlight from here? First, we highlight the fact that the Lord is preparing a place for us in heaven, each of us. Second, he's going to come to back for us, to take us there. Third, we are going to be with him in those mansions. Where? In heaven. Now, this is very different from what we read again in Revelation 19. I'm highlighting this, con I'm contrasting the rapture with Revelation 19, because Revelation 19 is a description of Christ coming with the armies. He is coming to crush the Antichrist and the false prophet, and he's coming to set up his kingdom here on earth. So in that coming, which we call as the second coming of Christ, he's not coming to take us into the mansions in heaven. He's coming to establishes kingdom here on earth and he says back on earth rule and reign which is very different from john 14 or first thessalonians 4 where he comes where we meet with him and he takes us to be with him in heaven so that's why we're saying the rapture is a very distinct or a very separate event from the second coming of christ Let's also read Philippians chapter 3. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, 21, where it will tell us about the bodies we receive. Philippians 3, 20, 21, please. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conform to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Mm. Thank you. So we are looking eagerly for the coming of the Lord. 
what will happen when he comes? Our mortal, lowly bodies will become like his glorious body. So we call it a glorified body. So as Paul described in 1 Corinthians 15, mortal will put on immort immortality, corruption will put on incorruptible. Our lowly bodies will become like his glorious body. And he's going to do it by the power which, with which he subdues everything. He'll subdue death. He'll subdue corruption. So that's why we say that when we are resurrected and when we receive glorified bodies, our bodies will be just like his body, meaning of that kind of substance which is immortal, never die. Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 he uses a different language, he uses a different language and he explains this for us. 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 1 to 4, please. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly, earnestly desiring to be clothed with a habitation which is from heaven. If indeed we have been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. So Paul in this place is comparing this, uh, the earthly body and the heavenly body as a house, you know, as a house in which we live. So he's saying, look, right now we are living in a house that is uh, this earthly house, which is, you know, it's, it's going to uh, decay. It's in this house we groan and be a burden, we have all of that. But he says, we are going to get a house, that means a body, which is eternal a glorified body that's heavenly body right and in in it is a it is a habitation or a house or a body that is from heaven it's heavenly and uh, and we will be clothed in that immortal body so just using a little different language basically saying that god has you know this glorified body for us so what will this glorified body be like it'll be just like the body that jesus had after his resurrection, it can pass through walls, and yet it can be touched and felt. Uh, it could eat. It could ascend into heaven. That means it just travels or it moves uh, uh, against natural laws. So it's something very different. Uh, we don't know exactly what substance it is, but we can see some characteristics of that glorified body. Uh, the substance of what it is made of. Okay, so we are going to have a body just like that. So now that leads us to a question, which is, when will the rapture take place? Right, and so in the next chapter we will look at the signs leading up to that. But what we do know. Uh, let's go to First Thessalonians 5. We're going to read this passage, verses 1 to 11. Uh, what we do know is that this coming of the Lord is, is at a time and a moment when we least expect. Right? So let's read First Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through 11, please. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, I have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of dark, you are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, 
let us watch and be sober for those who sleep sleep at night and those who get drunk drunk at night but let us who are of the day be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation for god did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation through our lord jesus christ who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing mm. thank you so some things to keep in mind you know when paul wrote this paul wrote his epistles he did not write it in chapter and verse so there is a continuing thought from what we just read earlier in chapter 4 you know we read chapter 4 verses 13 to 18 where he he's talking about the rapture of the church right he says the lord will there be the lord will descend from heaven and we who are alive will be caught up along with the dead in christ will be raised and we'll be caught up to meet him in the air that's chapter 4 verses 13 to 18 which we just read and he ends that segment by saying comfort yourselves with these words and then he's continuing with that same thought so although here in the in the bible now it's chapter 5 verse 1 uh, uh, paul is actually continuing with the thought that he has just completed telling us about that is the lord coming out of the clouds and us being caught up in to meet him in the air and he's we're going to be with the lord and he says concerning the times and seasons okay then the same thought that means the time of the season when this is going to happen when the rapture is going to happen when the lord is going to dis, you know descend and we are going to be caught up to meet him in the air that time and season he says his so brethren i i can't write you know there's nothing i can tell you about it ex exactly right there's no need for me to even tell you about it verse 2 for you yourselves know that means paul had preached about this to them when he was their person so remember paul had go to, had gone to thessalonica personally during a second missionary journey he had gone there and he had preached to them he had planted the church now he's writing a letter to them so he's telling them you know i uh, you know that means he's already told them he says the day of the lord so remember in chapter 1 as we introduced this whole course we mentioned the day of the lord the phrase the day of the lord the day of the lord can refer to different points in time in in this whole end time sequence of events in this passage first thessalonians 5 verse 2 the day of the lord has to be interpreted in the context what is the day of the lord here it's what he described for us a few verses earlier the lord coming and taking the church away that is the day of the lord that's what he's talking about in this passage right because it's all in context so he says the day of the lord this day the day when christ comes to you know to take his people away that day we don't know it comes like a thief in the night meaning when we least expect we're not expecting suddenly this will happen right so this coming of the lord for his church happens when we don't even expect that's why he says you know what we should always be ready we are sons of light so we got to live like that and uh, we got to be we watchful or six we have to be sober that means always live right because we don't know when this day is going to come and we need to be ready and so he says you know we uh, we need to put on the breastplate of faith and love and helmet and salvation and hope for salvation and god doesn't has not appointed us to wrath to judgment but he's called us to experience salvation through jesus christ so this can be understood in two ways one is god doesn't want us to experience eternal judgment but it can also be understood as in hey the judgment that follows this event right we know there's a 
judgment, the, the judgment of the world is following this event that's happening. After the church is taken out of the way, there's going to be the wrath that comes, that is poured out on the earth. So, First Thessalonians 5 9 is understood in two ways. God has not appointed us to wrath. What is the wrath? Well, there's a wrath that's going to be poured out immediately after this event that he has just described, after this day of the Lord. And God doesn't want us to go through that wrath, but he wants us to experience salvation through Christ. So whether we die or whether we are alive, we're going to live together with him. How are we going to live together with him? By what happens, First Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, he's going to come and he's going to take us away. We're going to live together with him. And once again, he repeats in verse 11, First Thessalonians 5, 11, comfort one another with these words right so what is the comfort we get in the previous portion he said comfort yourself in view of those who are dying in this one comfort yourself because we are not going to go through wrath but we're going to experience salvation through jesus so long as we live ready for the coming of the lord so comfort each other edify each other as you are doing okay now i want us to keep in mind we are going to look at you know the uh, another passage in second thessalonians later on but keep in mind that everything paul is writing in first thessalonians second thessalonians is in context and what is the context the context is paul has gone personally to thessalonica he has preached to them he has planted the church, and obviously during his time there in person, he has spoken to them about the end times. Now he's writing to them about things he has already spoken to them about. So he's reminding them about these things. And they have understood a sequence of events Paul has spoken to them about, which is there is the coming of the Lord for his people, and that coming happens like a thief in the night. And that coming preserves us from the wrath to come. Then in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says, hey, there is, he talks about what's going to happen after these events. So even in his epistles, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, there is a sequence he's following because you know in his mind it's not like necessarily two separate letters but there are two continuation okay letter one letter two the sequence is flowing through okay keep that in mind because when we read second thessalonians we read it in the context of all the things that have happened before as paul was relating to the thessalonians okay so let me pause here and see um you're with me so far in, in all the scriptures we have looked up. Any questions? Okay. So let's move forward. Um, feel free to ask questions if uh, anything comes up. All right. So we, I had mentioned earlier, uh, we will, you know, give an explanation about these trumpets. So um, uh, I was stressing the fact that the, the trumpets that we read or we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 and 1 Corinthians 15.52 should not be confused with the trumpets that we read about in Revelation, Revelation 11 uh, to 13, right? which are uh, the uh, uh, seven bowls, seven, sorry, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. So there's this, in, in the book of Revelation, there are three sets, seven each, of judgments being poured out. So there we will see there are seven seals, judgment, seven trumpets, judgment, and then there are seven bowls. So in the book of Revelation, those trumpets are announcing judgment being poured out on the earth. Whereas 
the trumpet we read about in First Thessalonians 4.16 and First Corinthians 15.52 are different. How do we say that? Because in both these situations, the context is not about judgment happening on the earth, unlike the seven trumpet judge, uh, seven trumpets in Revelation. In this context, it is having to do with believers and you know what God is doing with them. Right? So we explain um, that you know in the Old Testament, primarily trumpets were used to assemble people, gather people together, and to direct their movement. And uh, here we are seeing. And first trumpet being sounded, announcing the coming of Christ out of the heavens. Second trumpet being sounded, or the last trumpet being sounded, announcing the resurrection and the gathering of the church. Right. So that's how we understand these two trumpets that we read about in First Thessalonians chapter four, verse sixteen, and so on. And and it's it's a it's a wonderful parallel to what we see in the Old Testament where. Well, when, I, when the trumpet was sounded, you know, it was sounded to gather people together, summon them together. So it's a very beautiful parallel here when you know, the trumpet is sounded and the believers are gathered together to meet the Lord in the air. Right. So it's, it's a beautiful parallel. So keep that in mind. So when believers are in heaven during the seven years, what will happen in heaven? What do we see there? So I'm just outlined it here uh, we're not going to read all of these verses maybe we'll read a few in order to get some detail but these are the things that will happen in heaven we will be with him in glory colossians chapter 3 verse 4 we will see him as he is first john chapter 3 verse 2 uh, we will be like him living in glorified bodies again this is given for us in 1 John 3, 2. Uh, we will know God as we are known. Now, this is uh, amazing. That means there is uh, there is no limit, there is no barrier in our knowing God. We will know even as we are known. Uh, uh, and again, this is something we can't fully comprehend, but it seems like, our eyes and our spirit will will just know, and and know you know know God even as we are known. We will be welcomed into our mansions, like we we read in John fourteen. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive rewards for the work we have done. Uh, we will we're going to read these passages. Okay, uh, we will read it. We'll come back and read it. Um, we will engage in worship as kings and priests, and. Um, while we are in that seven years in heaven, we see that there will be people who are martyred here on earth and their spirits come up into heaven, right? We see that in Revelation chapter 6 and 7 and so on. So these people who come up to heaven, Revelation 14, you see the 144,000 Jews also in heaven. This is during the tribulation, okay? So we, seven years we are there and while we are there, there are people who are being martyred here on earth for the faith in Christ. We see their spirits coming up into heaven, joining us in worship. And this culminates with the marriage supper of the Lamb in Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. Okay, So these are the things we know will be taking place in heaven during those seven years while we are there. After the rapture of the church, the believers will be in heaven and this is what will happen. Now, I want us to read, before we finish up today, I want us to read two passages, 2 Corinthians 5.10, and we are also going to read 1 Corinthians 3.13-15, please. Somebody can read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Mm. Thank you. So Paul is telling believers 
right? It says, we must all, we means we all, all of us believers, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Right? So this judgment here is different from the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. Okay, different. This one is the judgment seat of Christ. That one is the great white throne judgment. Okay, now in the Greek, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, judgment seat is Bema, B-E-M-A in English, Bema. So people will call it the Bema seat, Bema judgment. The Bema judgment is the judgment seat for believers. The believer is going to be judged. And what is a believer being judged here for? He's going to be judged according to you know what he did here while he was on earth. Okay. Second uh, Revelation 20, that judgment is a judgment for whether your name is in the book of life or not. Very different. This judgment is for your reward. That judgment is different. Okay. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 3, where Paul gives us a little bit more detail on this judgment of the believer of the saints. 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, please. Uh, let one uh, work. Sorry, sorry. Uh, let's read from verse 12, please. Yes. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burnt, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, here Paul is telling us, see, it says, our work will be tested by fire. So our work, so the believer is already saved. We are saved by grace. We're not saved by works. So this has this is not about our salvation. This is this is about our rewards. So rewards are based on works. Salvation is based on grace. So we are already saved. But now the believer, their works, our works will be tested by fire. Did we do, you know, what was from God, which is gold, silver, precious stones? Or did we do things out of self, which is wood, hay, and straw? So whatever we did of our own self, you know, that would be burned. Only what we did according to the will of God, wood, uh, gold, silver, precious stones, that will remain. And then we will receive our reward. Now, verse 15, if somebody... All their works are burned. That means they have not, nothing to show. It's all gone. He says, yet they will be saved. Verse 15. They will suffer loss. That means they have, they have no reward. But he himself will be saved. That means even if we don't have any works that can get rewards, if all our works are all burned up, we will still be saved because we are saved by grace. But... Um, uh, only the works that are gold, silver, precious stones representing what is divine, what came from God, that will stand the test of fire, and that is what will receive reward. Okay, So both these passages, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 1 Corinthians 13, are talking about the believer's judgment. It's a, it's, it's a testing of the works to give the rewards to the believers. So this is going to happen when we are in heaven during those seven years, because that's the right place to put it. We don't see any other place where we can fit, you know, this this whole happening, because this is very exclusively for believers. And like I said, it is very different from the Great White Throne judgment. Okay? Now, let's quickly mention this, and then we will close for today. You know, in, in the New Testament, we see several kinds of rewards. Uh, be there, it's usually referred to as crowns. So we see several crowns. There's a crown of righteousness. Uh, there is an, you know, and I'm just looking at all the crowns that were mentioned in the New Testament. There's an imperishable crown, it won't die. It's a crown of rejoicing. There's a crown of life. Um, there's a crown of glory. 
uh, yeah, so these are the 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 crowns that that uh, are mentioned in the Bible. So basically, these are uh, rewards, are uh, expression of God's uh, rewards or appreciation for us, as you know, uh, he he places these things on our lives. Now, you know, whether or not we're going to be physically walking around with crowns, I don't think that's the point. The point is about God saying, "Look, this is uh, you know what I'm putting on you, I'm bestowing on you uh, as a, as an appreciation for the life you lived and the work you did." on earth right doesn't mean we'll all have crowns on our heads walking around like that um however this how it's going to happen uh, it's just a reward that, that god gives us for serving okay so we'll pause here we'll um, we'll see if there are any questions and you're welcome to ask we will you know go forward from here next week as we give reasons why do we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church and we'll pick up from here next week any questions on things we have spoken about so far is everything clear now are you all with me Jafina, you have a question yes pastor so uh, according to our works we will be rewarded right so then we also saw the rewards for the believers so uh, does it mean like uh, everyone will have Different rewards, or, or we will we will all have every rewards that is mentioned in the Bible, or it all depends on the works. Like some mm. will get this, some will get that, some may not get this. It is like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So from what we read here in First Corinthians three, the rewards will depend on the works that stand the test of fire. And he mentions here, Paul says, some people all their works will be burned. And so, therefore, they will get no reward. He mentions that in verse 15, in you know, 1 Corinthians 3.15, if anyone's work is burned, that means all their works are gone, he will suffer loss. That means he's not going to get any rewards. So that answers the question that there will be different people getting different rewards. And uh, and this these are rewards based on works, right? Uh, so there will be some who get certain rewards, some will get certain other rewards, and so on. And you also see, for example, uh, uh, the, one of the uh, one of the rewards he mentions in First Peter five. He says uh, he's referring to those who are uh, spiritual leaders. He says when the chief shepherd shall appear, you will receive a crown of glory which will not fade away. So he's talking to you know spiritual elders, leaders. Says you're going to receive a crown of glory. So that crown of glory is a reward given for spiritual leaders who have served the Lord well and righteously. They will receive that. So, so we see different rewards. Different. So different people will receive different rewards. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. All right. But I. But you know, I was thinking about a follow-up question to that. That doesn't mean. They, we will be made to feel bad, you know. Oh, that person got so much reward, I didn't get any reward. No, I don't think heaven is a place where uh, we're going to be in regret, feeling bad. Uh, I'm sure that the atmosphere there is going to be, uh, you know, just one of great rejoicing. So I don't think there's going to be that feeling of, you know, <laughs> oh, that person got more and me didn't get less or uh, me got less or whatever. That God will take care of that. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, I, I hope all of you are following with, with me. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask anytime. We'll continue this next week. And uh, uh, let's close in prayer, please. Could somebody close in prayer? And we will dismiss. Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful eschatological class that we are having these days, Lord. I want to thank everybody who attends this session, Lord, and this course in particular. But our, as we are trying to put our theology into perspective as far as last days are, are concerned, 
we do call upon your Holy Spirit, Lord, to guide us and teach us in everything. Lord, we also thank the pastor for the context he teaches this course, Lord. We know it's not a hard thing. It's not an easy thing to do. But we do appreciate the knowledge, the wisdom, the understanding, the skills, the attitude, and the values that you've rendered onto his life. So we do pray for his family, his wife, and uh, the little ones. And also the, the church that is also on his head, all oh Lord. I also pray for my brothers and sisters in this class so that they will revise these notes, me inclusive, Lord, because without understanding your eschatological studies, your hermeneutics is suffering. I do pray and believe that we shall meet again next Friday in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Bye now. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless.